and elders and the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Amen. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of the Jesus' companions reached out for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Putting the sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father? And he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must be, it must happen in this way? Father, we are grateful to you for your word. We pray that you will speak into our lives, breathe life into each and every one of us, Father. May we be revived, rejuvenated, and refreshed by the outpouring of your spirit and the ministry of God's word. Every resistance to the preaching of God's word, we bind them in the name of Jesus. Every critical spirit, be stilled. May the name of Jesus be exalted. We take victory here. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said, Amen, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Today's message is titled, Away with your swerve. Tell your neighbor, away with your sword. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It was the end of World War II. The American soldiers had moved into Berlin. And as they were gathering the leftover German soldiers... They found out that it was very strange that a couple of German soldiers were not responding to the instructions that were given. Upon close inspection, they found out that actually it, were not, it was not German soldiers. It was a couple of Tibetans, people from Tibet, who were wearing the Nazi uniform and they were picked up. Pretty soon they got an interpreter and they started conversing with these soldiers. And they found out there was a very interesting story behind the few Tibetans who were dressed as Nazi soldiers in Berlin. Upon close questioning, they found out, as they were told, that these Tibetans had just crossed over into Russia looking for a job. And the Russian soldiers picked them up, started using them as laborers. After some time, the German soldiers, when they took over, they got them and they put them into German uh, concentration camps. And pretty soon, when they were very low on manpower, they put them to work on the supply line. Gave them the German uniform and they put them to work on the supply line. Pretty soon everything had changed around and finally the American soldiers had picked them up. After hearing their very interesting story, the interpreter looked at these guys and asked them, do you have any questions? One of them said, sir, I have one question. Can you please tell me what is everyone fighting about? Quite often, people get into arguments, people get into quarrel, people start fighting, and many a times, people don't know really what it is that they are fighting about. And when people are not aware of what is it that they are fighting about, they will eventually start fighting with people that they are not supposed to fight with. They pick the wrong fight, and they pick the wrong person to fight with. And this is something that happens quite often with the children of God. As we read this particular passage, here we see Peter. Peter, we see that man who was full of zeal, his anger and his zeal was misdirected. 
And quite often, when our zeal is misdirected, it's very hard for us to identify between what is wrong and what is right. It's very hard to identify between what is right and what is wrong. Quite often, when our mind is not clear, when our outlook is clouded, when our reasonings are clouded, what happens is we cannot identify between a friend and a foe. Either this works or sometimes it don't work. I don't know. Okay. Uh, it's very hard to identify between a friend and a foe. From the life of this of Peter and from this particular portion, we can understand we can understand that Peter could not identify as to who the real enemy was. What was Peter doing? Peter was sleeping. And from the sleep, he was perhaps dazzled, shocked, bewildered, and he just woke up. And the Bible says he pulls out his sword and he swings it and he hits the, the servant of the high priest cuts his ear off. This is something that happens with God's children also because we often cannot identify who our real enemy is. The Bible clearly tells us who our real enemy is. We tend to lose sight of who our enemy is. As Paul tells the believers in Ephesians, he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. That means any time we pick a fight against a person, any time we pick a fight against a brother, a sister, we have misdirected and we pick the wrong enemy. Praise the Lord. Quite often we do not understand when we are ready to fight, we need to focus on the power or the influence that is working behind the scene. Praise God. Not the person standing before us, but the influence and the power of darkness that tend to brew in the lives of people and use them as instruments or agents of darkness to create confusion, chaos, and bring forth havoc in the lives of children of God. Praise God. May the Lord give us the insight and the understanding to understand who our real enemy is. Praise the Lord. When one fights against their parents, when one fights against their husband, against their wife, against their children, against their neighbors, against their fellow brethren, against their fellow sister, against those who really truly love them, we will realize that we are not picking on the right enemy, but our anger is misdirected. Praise God. Our attack ought to be directed not at the people around us, but against Satan and his cronies that are at work in the lives of the people of God. Praise God. It is very interesting to see as we read that particular passage, you know, Jesus was praying all night in the garden of Gethsemane. And as this particular incident unfolds before us, we see that Judas, who was one of the, one of the disciples of Jesus, had set everything up. He was ready to betray Jesus with a kiss. And he comes in the scene, and there was the soldiers behind him. You know what Jesus, how Jesus addresses Judas. Jesus looks at Judas and he addressed him as what? You betrayer, you no good, you person you who is going to double cross me. No, that's not what Jesus said, but rather Jesus said, friend, praise the Lord. Interesting, isn't it? Friend. 
But the disciple of Jesus, Peter, was ready to react in a very, very unusual way. Unusual to the one who has brought the message of love. Unusual to the one who had heard the message of love and the message of reconciliation, the message of forgiveness. When Jesus was portraying a, 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 a response that was out of this world, one of his disciples was ready to take the sword and he was ready to swing because his zeal and anger was misdirected. Look at Christ. Christ calls Judas his friend. Praise God. Anyone who ushers us into the will of God. I want the church to listen to this very carefully. Anyone who ushers us into the will of God, knowingly or unknowingly, maliciously or benevolently, they are your friend. Praise the Lord. Amen. You see, from a worldly perspective, that looks very awkward. That looks very odd. But look at the life of Jesus. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. The night before, he told his disciples who it was that was going to betray him. But when the moment came, Jesus calls him a friend. Praise God. Church, I want you to ask you this morning, do you have a friend? Praise God. We all have friends. Let me tell you, if your friend is a friend, who would stand with you when you are going down the drain? If, if you have a one who calls himself or herself your friend, but would not lift the smallest finger to help you, to redirect you, to guide you, to put you back in the right path, he or she who claims to be your friend is not your friend, number one. Number two, a friend sticks closer than a brother. Who is a friend? A friend is one who tells you the truth. A friend is one who speaks the truth in love. A friend is one who would not stand with you when you are in harm's path. A friend is one who would alert you and try to put you right in path. Number two. Number three, we all have so-called friends who do not want to do the right thing for us. They think they, they tend to do things that can harm us, that can maim us, that can push us into, into, into places and situations that can actually destroy our lives. They are not truly your friend. But you and I serve a master who's, a, who's one who loves and who teaches us to love our enemies. If you and I are the child of God, if we are the children of God, even when people does the worst to us, I want you to know God who is sovereign, God who is still on the throne, he's able to rule and overrule every Every verdict, every decision, every attack that comes against your life. And he can redirect the assault that comes against you. He can make it for your good. Because God is ultimately in control of our lives. Praise the Lord. He can take your enemy and he can make him your friend. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. If God is pleased with a man and in his ways, the Bible says he can take his enemy and he can make him your friend. Praise God. May you and may you and I be guided and directed by the principles of God's word so that when an assault comes, against us you and I would not react like the world reacts but we react like Jesus reacted he called the one who was going to betray him my friend praise God hallelujah praise God hallelujah you know quite often it's very hard for us to 
identify a friend, a foe. But let me tell you, even when you and I miss who our foe is, God will give us the grace to overcome any and every situation. Number one, we said that Peter fought the wrong enemy. Tell your neighbor, don't fight the wrong enemy. Praise the Lord. In other words, when something out of the, something that is, ex, uh, something that is unexpected happens in your life, don't look around who your enemy is, but send a prayer to the Lord so that you and I are able to gauge and understand and distinguish between the right and the wrong enemy. Praise the Lord. Second thing, Peter used the wrong choice of weapon. What did Peter use? The Bible says he pulled out his sword and he swung one of the high priest's servants and he cut his ear off. Peter used a real sword when he was surrounded by trained soldiers. You and I are in a spiritual warfare. Only a spiritual weapon is allowed for a soldier who is a soldier in the army of Jesus Christ to use. You and I are not allowed. We are not, we are not allowed. You and I have no permission to use carnal weapons or the weapons of the world to respond to the assault that comes against us. Our weapons of warfare are spiritual. Praise the Lord. When people, when the world around us is trying to bring forth our bring forth harm to us, you and I can use the spiritual weapons. When Peter used this, this word, Jesus told him to put the sword back. Praise God. You and I have a spiritual sword, which is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword that a believer is called to employ is the one, is the one that does not cut physically, but one that would cut the, the spiritual foe off. What is it? It is the word of God. The word of God that is uttered from a believer's mouth, from a believer who is anointed by the Lord, from a believer who is walking in obedience to the Lord, from a believer who is walking in light, from a believer who is walking in love, from a believer who is walking in wisdom, from a believer who is walking like Jesus walked, your words that comes out of your mouth, the word of God has the power and the potency to dismantle the strategies of the enemy that bruise against the life of the children of God. When enemy unleashes his power and his arsenal against you, may God anoint you and me to speak, to utter the word of God and the oracles of God, which will dismantle, praise God, disable the work of the enemy. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Words have power. And a believer's words have the power as well. We've been called to build, to edify the body of Christ. Hallelujah. At the same time, we've been called to demolish the strongholds of the enemy that tends to rise in the life of people around us. Do you, at the same time, you and I ought to be careful that we do not use the word of God as a weapon to cut each other up. Praise God. Peter fought the wrong enemy and Peter used the wrong weapon. Praise the Lord. So identify who the right enemy is. Use the right weapon, which is the word of God, the sword of the spirit. Third, Peter had a wrong mindset. What does that mean? Having a wrong mindset. Jesus was praying in the garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus, after agonizing in prayer, 
had finally submitted himself to the will of the Father. He prayed, God, the Father, not my will, let your will be done. If possible, take this cup away from me, but yet not my will, but let your will be done. And Jesus had submitted himself to the will of the Father. Praise God. After the prayer was over, we know that the soldiers had come to arrest him. But Peter had got up from his sleep and his slumber and was ready to use his sword. I want you to look at two pictures. The first picture that we looked was Jesus calling Judas his friend. And Peter using the sword against perhaps a defenseless person, the, pre, the, the high priest sermon. Here what we see is Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, which meant Jesus was willing to put himself in the hands of the enemies that had come to try him, to crucify him, because through the path of suffering, Jesus was going to bring forth a great deliverance to God's people. Praise God. But Peter, who was in sleep and in slumber, he acted contrary to the will of the Father. Praise God. Peter was fighting completely out of order and out of harmony for the will of God. Praise God. Against the will of Christ. Praise God. Listen to me. When you and I do not have the mind of Christ, we tend to take on a different mindset. We do things that are contrary to the Father's will because we do not understand the will of the Father. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, but the actions of Peter was contrary to the mind and the will of God. It was out of order. It was out of harmony to the will of God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Interesting, isn't it? From a worldly perspective, we would give accolades to Peter who stood against the soldiers that was going to attack Jesus. But Jesus reacted differently because he had submitted himself to the will of the Father. Taking an analogy from the Old Testament, do you remember the rebellion that occurred against David? His own son, Absalom, had risen against David. And there was a rebellion. And, the, and, and there was an army that was pursuing David. And David got out of Jerusalem. And he was out on the run. When he was out on the run, a man, came, a man called Shimei comes and he starts cursing King David saying, you bloodthirsty man, you deserve it. One of the commanders of David, Abishai, he wanted to pull his sword out and take the head of Shimei. But David restricts him. And this is what David tells him. David tells him, perhaps the Lord has allowed him to say these words to me. And David stops Abishai from killing Shimei off. David realized that Shimei was a part of a process where God was doing a deep work of humility in the life of David. Praise God. Quite often, you and I don't realize the assault that comes against our life. If we respond to it, in a godly manner. If we respond to it according to the biblical principle matter, what happens is God does a deeper, wider work in each one of us so that we come out radiating with his glory. We come out radiating with his grace. We come out 
clothed with humility. We come out looking different, not looking like the world because we did not respond like the world. The worldly respond would have been allowing Abishai to use this word against the man who cursed David. But David restricts him. Likewise, the, the response of Jesus is contrary Contrary to the worldly standard. And this is what God desires from every child of God. Armed with the right mindset. Praise God. You and I ought to be armed with the right mindset. Praise God. Peter, Jesus picked three of his disciples pulled them to the side in the garden of Gethsemane and asked them to tarry with me for one hour. Praise God. But they could not do it. If they had done it, they would have looked at the situation in a totally different light. Folks, when we spend time in the presence of God, praise God, the events that unfold before us, whether it is contrary to us or it is for us, we are armed with the mind of God to look at the events from a different perspective, from a heavenly outlook, and that will affect our response and our actions. Jesus tells Peter, Peter, put away your sword. Your mindset is wrong. Jesus would come out of this, not as a victim, but he would come out, as, out of this as a victor. Jesus would not come out of this as a loser, but as a winner. So is the case of every child of God that would employ the principles of God's word in every scenarios and situations of your life. When the world looks at you and me and say that you are a victim, your time in the presence of God, your outlook a godly outlook and a godly response to the situation that we go through in our lives would not make us a victim, but we will come out as victors. We are not losers. We are winners through Jesus Christ. Praise God. Finally, praise God. He fought for the wrong reason. Praise God. Have you ever thought, why is it that Peter drew out his sword against the servant of the high priest? The reason Peter drew his sword was to protect the Lord from the soldiers who had arrived to capture Jesus. Do you think Jesus needed protection? As he called us to protect him, check the words of Jesus. This is what Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will, he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Look at this. Jesus is telling Peter, hey, Peter, I, you know, perhaps you are trying to defend me and to protect me do you think that I cannot ask for protection? And my father would give me 12 legions of, not soldiers, but angels to protect me. Do you know how many, how many is one legion? One legion is 6,000. If that's the case, 6 times 12 is. So 72,000 angels at the disposal if we would just ask and quite often you and I we respond to Jesus like this we feel that we have to protect him we feel that we have to protect his interest we feel that we have to guard his name 
and we go out of our way, use unconventional methods, use methods that are not biblical in nature because we want to protect Jesus. We want to protect the interest of Jesus. We want to protect the name of Jesus. And Jesus is telling Peter, hey, Peter, put your sword back. You don't need to do this. Praise God. See, we have to understand that when we stand for Jesus, we are not allowed to employ unbiblical methods to defend him and to defend his cause. Praise God. At times, believers, people who follow Jesus, they are full of zeal. Has he called you to straighten out a wrong situation in your own energy? We use our own energy. We use our own methods. What he did was wrong. Therefore, I must stand for the Lord. Well, don't we say that? It is a wrong situation. Therefore, I need to act. This is unjust. Therefore, I need to act. Hey, we all think like that from time to time. If God has called you to tackle every unjust situation... And if God has given you the wisdom to do so, go ahead, do so. But make sure that the Lord has called you to do so. Praise the Lord. If God has not called you to do so, don't get into it. Because we get into a lot of unwanted situation in the name of being just carrying out justice and in the end we find out that we make more mess than what the mess was originally praise God but here we see perhaps Peter wanted to protect Jesus yes perhaps Peter wanted to demonstrate his loyalty his allegiance his love for Jesus Perhaps he wanted to prove to Jesus, Jesus, you told me that I'm going to deny you. But here, I am ready to stand for you. I am even ready to take this word for you. In his mind, he ought to take care of the injustice that was being imposed at Jesus. Praise God. Yes, how often we want to show our love, our allegiance, take care of an unjust situation. Or simply display how spiritual we are by nailing the person, nailing the situation, nailing the unjust cause, and create much more issues than what it was. What is the biblical principle for this? When we find things that are going uh, in a way that is unjust. Look. This is what the Lord wants us to do. What is it that the Lord wants us to do? The Lord would often want us to love and leave the judgment to him. This is how Paul puts it. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. Praise the Lord. We who are crusaders that fight against injustice, this is the word, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time, Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. What does that mean? It simply means we don't need to play God. Let God be God. Hello. We don't need to play God. Let God be God. Does that mean there is no room for correction? Does that mean we tolerate nonsense? Does that mean we just wink at things that are wrong? Does that mean we turn a blind eye? No, 
as I said before, if the Lord has chosen you to be an instrument of correction or intervention, do it, but don't let the sword fly indiscriminately, bringing, creating hurt and wounds that becomes beyond fixing. Praise God. But if the Lord has given you the sword of the Spirit in your hand, praise God, use it, use it. I said, use it, use it as a skillful surgeon. Praise the Lord. God has not given us the word to use it any way you want. Praise God. God has not given us words. God has not given us the power to say things. God has not given us the power, the skill to write, to do whatever we feel like. Praise God. If one preach, if one teach, if one exhort, if one write, do it skillfully like a surgeon that is able to extract the venom, extract the tumor, extract the block, extract anything that does not belong to the body at the same time. Skillfully, praise God, put things back in order. This is what God asks us to do. That is a grace that God has given. And if God has given you the grace to do so, please do so. Like Peter, praise God, we all have been wrong. Is there anybody in this place who have always done what is right? Nobody. Is there anybody in this place that has always done that which is wrong? Nobody. Good. Is there anybody in this place who have done right once in a while? Is there anybody in this place? One hand's up. That's good. I don't know. He was scratching his head or he was waving. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is. Is there anybody in this place that has done a wrong? We all have. Praise the Lord. We all have done things which are wrong. But when God speaks to us through his word, through the scripture, you and I ought to be humble to yield ourselves to the correction that comes from God's word. The rebuke that comes from God's word. The exhortation that comes from God's word. Because the Bible says all scripture is God breathed. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction. So that the man of God may be complete and fully equipped for all good works. Praise God. Yes, like Peter we all have been wrong from time to time. But when we come to him humbly, the Lord will begin to heal. Praise God. The Lord will begin to heal the people that we have wounded. Hello. Now if we agree that from time to time we have done mistakes, we have done things which are wrong. That includes saying things which are wrong. That includes doing things which are wrong. That includes um, anything that we have done wrong. That means people have been wounded. But God is able to bring forth a healing into the lives of people that we have wounded. At the same time, God is also able to bring forth healing in our lives we who have been wounded by others. Is there anybody in this place who have been wounded by others? One. Anybody wounded by others? This is not a trick question. If you've been wounded by others, you need healing. And if you need healing... Number one thing that you need to do is let go of that, that offense. The one thing that we need to do is forgive them so that the forgiveness from above, the healing virtue from above, 
will fill and flood our heart and it will minister to that wounded heart, to that bleeding heart, to that wounded spirit so that God can do a greater work in us and through us. Now as we acknowledge that we've been wounded by others, we also need to ask ourselves, have we wounded anyone? And if we have wounded anyone, it is God has to heal them as well. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's come humbly to the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, heal the people that we have wounded with our words, with our writings, with our behavior, with our mindsets. And of course, if we've been wounded, he can heal us as well. Praise God. Like me, like us, praise God. We might have been all wrong from time to time. But let me present to you one who is right all the time, every time, in every situation, that is Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. He can undo the wrong that has been done to you. Praise God. He can undo the wrong that is done to you. If you are a victim this morning to someone's ploy, plot, scheme, device, words, I want you to come to Jesus. Open your heart bare and show him your wounds. There is no need to act as if we are macho. We all are human beings who is able to get hurt. But when we open our hearts to Jesus, he will pour the oil and the wine. Praise God. There is an old song like this that comes from that parable, from that story that Jesus shared about the good Samaritan. He poured in the oil and the wine. Praise God. Hallelujah. He poured in the oil and the wine. The kind that restoreth my soul. Praise God. Hallelujah. When you're bleeding and when your inner man, it seems as if is dying. What you need is the good Samaritan to come your way. And he's able to pour in the oil and the wine. This morning, Jesus wants to pour in the oil and the wine. And when the master physician, he pours the oil in the wine. It would flow right into that place, into that very location where you've been wounded, which is inaccessible to people around you, which is beyond the reach of people who minister to you. But the good Samaritan, Jesus, the great physician, is here with the balm of Gilead. Praise God. He wants to pour that oil and the wine. The kind that will restore your soul. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Only Jesus is right all the time. And we, we stand with him. And when we employ his word, employ his standard, employ his principle, even when it looks as if it's out of this world. God gives us the grace to be overcomers. Not to be victims, but victors. Not to be losers, but winners. Jesus has called you and me to be a winner. So put that sword down. So put that revenge, avenge attitude out. Praise God. Take the sword of God's word. Use it skillfully. Allow the healer to heal your wound. Praise God. So the ministry that you do in the body of Christ will bring wholesomeness, wellness, and healing to the body of Christ. All eyes closed. Are you wounded this morning, my friend? Maybe you received a wounding. The heat, the, the cut, the stress.
strike right in the house of God. Maybe it has come from a friend, from a person who called himself your friend. Praise God. If it happened to Jesus, it can happen to any one of us. If it came from one who walked with Jesus for three and a half years, it can happen to any one of us. But when that does happen, would you allow Jesus to take control of it? You do the loving part. Let Christ do the judging part. Praise God. Come to him. Open your heart. Allow him to pour the healing word. Thank you, Jesus. This morning as you hear God's word, whether you are wounded by someone else or you have wounded anyone else, this is the moment for you to stand up before him and say, Lord, here I come. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Burdens are rolled away at Calvary. Wounds are healed at Calvary. Bruises are healed in the presence of Jesus. Broken hearts are mended in the presence of God. Shattered lives are fixed in His presence. Shattered dreams are put together back in the presence of the Master. Look at the Master. The fellow who came to arrest Him. Jesus picked up his ear, put it right back in place, healed him, restored him. Ah, oh, isn't that a beautiful picture? No spirit of bitterness, no spirit of hatred, no spirit of vengeance, simply love, oozing out of the one who came to demonstrate the love of Jesus. That love is beckoning. All who are offended, all who have created an offense. Thank you, my father. Jesus. Hallelujah. My friend. The presence of God is open for you. The throne of grace is wide open. Through Jesus you can enter. You can lay bare your heart before him. And show him. Where your wounds are. Show him when it's broken. Let him do a work on you. Jesus. Jesus. As we sing a song. All those who need prayer. I want you to stand up wherever you are. This is not an altar call, but wherever you are, I want you to stand. Whether you have been wounded or you have wounded someone. This is a time when God is dealing with you. God wants you to walk out of this place whole, healed, well, ready to be a channel of blessing. Mm. Jesus. I